the world's most honored is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. Our guest on the Longines Chronoscope this evening is Princess Alexandra Kropotkin a direct descendant of the first Tsar of old Russia. Her father was exiled from Tsarist Russia because of his liberal views. Princess Kropotkin returned to Russia in 1915, lived there through the early days of the revolution, and it was her fate to be imprisoned by the communists. In time, she escaped to America and has since worked for the liberation of her people. May I present Princess Kropotkin. Our co-editors are Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, political economist and associate editor of Newsweek magazine. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Princess Kropotkin, uh, Secretary Atchison testifying on June 26 before a congressional committee said that America's quarrel today is not with world communism or with the dictators in the Kremlin, but with old-fashioned Russian nationalism. He said, and I quote, it is clear, he said, that this process of encroachment and consolidation by which Russia has grown in the last 500 years from the Duchy of Moscovy to a vast empire must be stopped. Now, do you agree with that statement of the issue? No, I never agree with Mr. Atchison anyway. That's a Machiavellian statement, and I think a rather bad one. Well, what do you think is wrong with it, Prime Minister? Well, uh, after all, uh, if there weren't communism at the present moment, there wouldn't be Russian nationalism, imperialism. There'd be a country where there was some kind of, perhaps, democracy for the people. Well, do you think that this uh, view of the subject tends to uh, consolidate the Russian people with Stalin instead of recognizing the fact that a lot of them are opposed to the Stalin regime? Well, 80% is supposed to be opposed and probably more. And I don't think that there are very many Russians, as opposed to communists, who are in the least interested in expansion, territorial expansion, or anything of the kind. What, what is the evidence? That's not the danger. Yes. What, what is the evidence, uh, as you see it, that they're that percentage of the Russian people that are opposed to oh, communism? Oh, that's regime? a long story to go into what uh, one considers is the, the... why one considers it's 80 percent. It's about that. One hears that from people who will, have escaped from Russia, from the quantities of prisoners, from the many sources of evidence, uh, all of which has been collected by various groups now. It's quite a good deal of evidence. What do you think is the main thing that can be done to take advantage of that situation? We have these potential allies in Russia. Well, many things. Propaganda, of course, such as being carried on, uh, perhaps accentuated, um, propaganda by various radio, free Russia, and so on. Uh, that Princess is Kropotkin playing quite a part already. Yes, sir. Pardon me, but uh, <coughs> I think the American people would like to hear something from you about actual life in Russia. And one of the things that we hear a great deal about are Russian secret police. Now, in America, where nobody's afraid of a policeman, the average American finds it hard to finds it difficult to believe all the stories we hear about the effectiveness of the Russian police. Now, how, it, how is it possible for the Russian secret police to exert, cause such terror among the people? Well, first of all, it's a quantitative thing. You see, under the Tsars, the secret police, the Okhrana, uh, was a personnel of about 5,000 people. 
In Russia today, there are over two million uh, MCAD and their day agents and so on. That's the Russian Communist Secret Police. Yes, and um, how many how many people, how many Russians would you estimate have been put in concentration camps? Well, that estimate varies. It varies from 12 to 20 million people. And how many were in, in uh, how many political prisoners were there in an average year under the Tsar? Oh, the figure never exceeded much over 50,000. That was see. in prison and in exile and so on. You see, you ask how it's possible to have instilled so much terror. First of all, there is incredible poverty and so much difficulty and energy goes into every little thing that people need for everyday life. Secondly, there's <coughs> a, uh, a horrible system of spying on one another, which the communists have managed to develop. That's it's a refinement. A, that's a, a refinement. moral leprosy. I see. And that's something that's new in the police system. Oh, yes. There was, there were people who denounced others and who uh, spied, but not like it is now. Let me ask you, uh, it, once a, a Russian is put in a concentration camp, is there any hope of release? Do they release them, any of them to come back home? Sometimes some get out. After they come out, they're usually only allowed to live in certain places, certain towns. Most of them come out in such a fearful state that they are finished anyway. They come out to die. And very few do get out of concentration camps. Really, they aren't concentration camps, they're prison camps. But then the whole of Russia is a prison camp, practically, <coughs> anyway. Princess Kropotkin, there's certain facts which, to a lot of Americans, wouldn't seem to jibe with this belief that the large majority of the Russian people are opposed to the regime. For example, they fought very well uh, against Germany, <laughs> The uh, North Koreans, the uh, Chinese communists are fighting very well. They're not surrendering in mass to uh, the Americans in Korea. They seem to have a very good morale. And if the satellites have that good a morale, it wouldn't be a good supposition that the Russian soldiers would have an even better morale. Russians have always fought well. They've never been cowards. That's a trait of the Russian people. But you've also got to remember that a great many of the younger people who were born under communism, they don't like the regime, they would welcome something different, but when it comes to fighting an enemy, they'll fight for any kind of government. They'll always fight. But during World War II, an enormous number of Russians went over and formed even a battalion in Germany to fight back against Russia. They all hoped that the Germans were going to liberate them. And if the Germans had behaved decently to the Russians, they would have had a tremendous number of volunteers. As it was, there were nearly a million. So you think if our propaganda were right and our treatment were right, if we ever did get involved in a war, why we would have wholesale desertions and there would be a quick uh, I collapse of the regime there, perhaps? Possibly, yes. Uh, I certainly think that propaganda, when it reaches the Russians, and a great deal of it does now, uh, has an enormous effect. And also, if they knew what was going to happen to them. Uh, for, for instance, uh, I don't know if you know this uh, new word that's used, not for deserters, but defectors. Well, now, there were, in 48 and 49, they used to come over to the American zone 50, 60 a day. Now there are only two. And the reason for that is that nothing special has been done for them. They don't know what's going to happen to them if they do desert and come into the American zone. Well, Francis, I'd like to <coughs> ask you just a few questions about the nature of the underground and how we can make it more effective. Now, when I read uh, Gorky and Dostoevsky, I got the impression that the Russians were a natural conspiratorial people, that there was always a, a, a large group that was against the government, and militantly so. Now, today, it, does such a group exist in, the, in Russia? Not as a group, because it's impossible for people to meet together and to talk, to discuss anything. Uh, you'd be either liquidated or in a prison camp if you had ever even thought 
of writing a story about the terrible tempered Mr. Stalin, yes. which you did. Now, uh, well, uh, is there is there a potential underground? Yes, there is. And, now, and, and, uh, and <laughs> as to ways in which we might encourage it, do you think that our propaganda is effective now? Not as effective as it might be. First of all, there's a religious underground, and that really does exist. Uh, I think that there are quite a few things to be done to step up propaganda. Well, what about the Voice of America? Well, you think it's effective? All, up to a point, all the, uh, all the radio stations which are carrying news into Russia are effective. Unquestionably, they're reaching many people. But I do think that they might uh, perhaps liven up the stuff yes. a little bit. And <laughs> it's a well, little bit dull. As a final question, I'd like to ask you, Princess Kropotkin, what do you think we could do now to drive a wedge? What's the first step we could take now to drive a wedge between the Kremlin and the Russian people? Well, I'm going to give you a peculiar answer. I think that if the representatives of the Kremlin in this country were treated to a little social ostracism instead of being invited to dinner parties, if they were ridiculed a little, and that went back, on the radio. I think that that might have quite a little effect. And so you would say, in summing up, uh, Princess, you would say that there is a potential underground and that properly encouraged, it can be very hopeful for the Western world. I think so. I think it can be the most hopeful thing in the world because it's probably the only way out of a war. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Princess Alexandra Kropotkin. The little black-mounted magnifying glass that the watchmaker holds like a monocle in his eye is called a loop. After years of observing watches of all kinds, new and old, the man with the loop becomes an excellent judge of watches. And we're proud of the fine letters about Longines watches, which come to us every day from long-established watchmakers. A typical communication reads, The quality of Longines watches is beyond compare. As an experienced watchmaker, the fine workmanship commands my admiration. After years of observation of long jeans and other watches, I am convinced that no watch gives so much satisfaction as a long jean, nor lasts so long. Yes, indeed. The man with the loop knows why long jean watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Superlative quality through and through makes Longine the world's most honored watch. This is Frank Knight inviting you to join us again next week for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Sold and serviced by more than 4,000 leading jewelers from coast to coast, who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.